So what is thermoelectricity? It's not something terribly new. In fact, it was discovered in 1821 by this German fellow, Thomas Seebeck. What you see in this cartoon here, well, I don't quite get that. Yeah. So what you see in this cartoon is a specimen, some material which is heated on the right side and cooled down on the left side. And the, the little balls inside represent uh, charged particles, could be electrons. So they're moving faster on the hot side and slower on the cold side. So they, they accumulate over on that cold side where they're moving more slowly. And that leads to a voltage across the material, which is a difference in electrical energy. And so thermoelectricity is a way of converting this heat directly into electrical energy. And it does so without any moving parts. So it, it is like a heat engine, similar to a steam engine or an internal combustion engine. But the gas that's, that's providing the power is the, are the electrons themselves, which stay within the material so it has no moving parts. It's solid state. And the no moving parts is kind of the strength and the weakness. Because with no moving parts, you know, you can't compress the gas with a piston or, or anything like that. So that's made it challenging over the years. It's been almost two centuries to improve this. So what could we do with thermoelectricity? Well, here is a, a demonstration. Uh, on the left, you see that's a car uh, in development by BMW uh, where they have coated the catalytic converter and I believe part of the exhaust header with a thermoelectric. And they're able to harvest enough electrical energy out of that that they can uh, get rid of the alternator. And so that uh, without wasting the energy for the alternator to recharge the batteries, it, it makes the car about 5% more efficient, I believe. And I think the application of something like that in a hybrid vehicle would be even more impressive. But waste heat is everywhere. I mean, there's waste heat from factories. Even the human body produces waste heat. And here you see some boots that are uh, allowing this lady to power her uh, iPhone just from the waste heat from her body. Um, also, if you think about solar, uh, especially in a place like Tucson where there's a lot of sunlight, the solar panels actually heat up a lot because a lot of the solar spectrum is just wasted as heat. And then the, then the panels don't work as efficiently. So if you could kind of combine thermoelectrics with solar, you could actually take the heat away from the, the photovoltaic and make the whole system more efficient. So since this idea has been around since 1821, why aren't we there yet? Right? What, where are all these applications? Well, it's tough. It's, uh, thermoelectricity is a very well studied phenomenon, um, but it's just not efficient enough and not cheap enough to make it to market. So to understand why it's so challenging to make an efficient thermoelectric, it's useful to take a step back and, and, and go to fundamental principles. So let's go back to the laws of thermodynamics. The first law tells us that heat is a form of energy. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be converted from one form to another. So heat can be converted to electricity, and electricity can be converted to heat. That's all well and good. However, the second law of, of thermodynamics st states that the entropy of the universe, i.e. the randomness or disorder, is constantly increasing. Now, anybody who has children, like I do, knows that if you just leave the room for like half an hour, what was a perfectly clean room is now strewn with all kinds of objects. It's a horrible mess. It takes a lot of energy to clean up. Now imagine if instead of little stuffed animals and plastic toys, imagine if this mess was made out of individual atoms and molecules, trillions upon trillions upon trillions of them, then it wouldn't just be difficult to clean up the mess. It would actually be impossible. So that's what the second law says. The mess of the universe is constantly increasing, and there's no way around that. So what does that have to do with thermoelectricity? Well, if you add heat to a body, it increases its entropy, increases the randomness and disorder. If you take heat away from a body, it decreases the entropy. Okay. On the other hand, electrical energy has no randomness, no entropy. It's just a pure, clean form of energy. So if you were to take heat out of a body and convert it entirely into electrical energy, you would have decreased the disorder of the universe, but that is impossible, cannot be done. The best that you can do is a process that leaves the net randomness of the universe unchanged. And even that is extremely difficult to achieve. In fact, it's impossible. There's no man-made heat engine that's ever achieved that limit. 
Um, but, you know, things like the internal combustion engine, they are pretty efficient and they are much more efficient than, than thermoelectrics, unfortunately. So if we could just reach this break-even point, that would be awesome and that would be more than good enough to get a lot of uh, applications. So what is a possible way around this bothersome second law of thermodynamics? Well, James Clerk Maxwell, who is one of the founding fathers of the theory of thermodynamics, imagined a demon, which has since become known as Maxwell's demon, this demon could actually observe the motions of individual atoms and molecules and could lead to violations of the second law of thermodynamics. For instance, if you had a, a container of gas divided into two sides with a little trap door in between, the demon could open and close that door to selectively allow certain molecules through. For example, the demon could allow faster molecules to move from side A to side B and slower molecules to move from B to A, but not vice versa. And in so doing, he would allow the entropy of the universe to decrease, and heat would flow from the cold side to the hot side, both of which are violations of the second law of thermodynamics. So this seems too good to be true. Like, why don't we just get these demons? Well, the problem is, if you consider the demon as also part of the physical universe and describe the demon with the laws of physics, well, he's got to dissipate energy to open and close that door. He's even got to dissipate energy to observe and record which molecules are fast and slow. And if you include that in your calculation, you find that the best you can do is the break even, no net increase in the disorder of the universe. Okay, but even though you can't beat the second law, the demon perhaps provides an idea of how we could get close to the limits implied by the second law, which is the best we can hope for, obviously. Otherwise, I'm out of a job. Okay, so how could we hope I told you the problem with thermoelectrics and their benefit is that there's no moving parts, right? No moving parts means there's no pollution, right? The electrons are just in there and move around. They don't come out. Um, so there, there's no pollution, but the problem is you don't have as many knobs and things to manipulate the gas and make a more efficient heat engine. However, electrons are governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. And according to quantum mechanics, there's a principle called wave-particle duality. It says particles behave like waves, and waves behave like particles. Okay, and so I got my kind of entree into this field of single molecule devices in thinking about a single molecule transistor, which we patented and called the QUIET, the quantum interference effect transistor. And so the way that that works, you see, I'm sorry, the <coughs> pointer is not so good, but here imagine you have this emitter and this collector, going through this single molecule in the form of a ring. There's a kind of picture there of what, what I'm imagining. And it ends up, because the electrons are waves, and because the path lengths around these, these two waves around this ring are different in length, it ends up that those waves interfere destructively. What does that mean? That means, let's say, when a wave coming this way has a crest when it reaches this collector, a wave coming that way has a trough, and so the trough and the crest annihilate each other and you get nothing. So the electrons simply cannot get from here to here in that configuration. Even though there's no energy barrier preventing them from going there, they just can't get there because of their wave-like character. Okay, but um, so enough of that. Let's go on to thermoelectrics. That was the next thing I got interested in. It ends up if you make a bunch of these rings in a row, so here we have like a, f oops, a forest of molecules grown on a metal surface, each of which has multiple ones of these rings, connected together, and we bring down a metal tip to contact them from above, and let's say we heat the lower surface, it ends up that the interference of those electron waves gives rise to a very large thermoelectric effect. So this, sorry, this is a little technical, but this middle panel shows S, that's named after Seebeck, the Seebeck coefficient or thermal power, that is the voltage you get per degree difference in temperature across the material. Okay, and current technology has that about 100, 150 so-called microvolts per Kelvin. So we need to do better than that in order to make thermoelectricity economically viable. So we show that, for instance, if you have six of these ring-like molecules connected together, you actually get 1,000 microvolts per Kelvin, which is about six to 10 times better than current technology. And moreover, this parameter ZT, which is called the dimensionless figure of merit, this is basically telling you how close can you get to this break-even point, the best you can possibly do according to the second law. Current technology has ZT of about one. Um, conventional heat pumps and heat engines have ZT of about four and above. We show that with six of these molecules hooked together, you could get ZT 
between six and seven, and with even longer molecules, you can get it even higher. So at that point, thermoelectricity would be competitive with the internal combustion engine. So I'm a theorist. I do my work with pen and paper and computer. But a year after we published our prediction, uh, a group at uh, UC Berkeley did an experiment with a similar molecule with these same kind of ring-like uh, structures in it, but this, this one in the form of a ball. This is called buckyball or buckminster fullerene. And they, they applied a temperature difference right across this tiny molecule, less than a billionth of a meter across. And indeed, they were able to measure the voltage difference, and they got a thermal power of 90 microvolts per Kelvin, which is almost as good as the best in current technology. Okay, so we understand mathematically, and also in the laboratory, how to make this efficient thermoelectric at the single molecule level, but we don't really understand how is it working conceptually, okay? And in order to understand that or to get some clue, we, if we look at the local temperature within this molecule, that's going to provide us with a clue. Okay, so what do you mean by the local temperature within a molecule? Where it, well, it ends up that there's a technology called a scanning thermal microscope. You can get an atomically sharp tip and use that essentially as a thermometer, and you can manipulate it over a, a surface with subatomic precision. And you can actually make, uh, measure the temperature with, uh, very locally within a system. So what could we do? Theoretically, we could actually look at one of these single molecules with a hot side and a cold side and see what does the temperature look like within the molecule. So this is a so-called pyrene molecule. And you see that there's a cold side and a hot side. The cold is blue, the hot side is red. Uh, there's a temperature difference of 50 degrees across this molecule. But it doesn't just have a hot side and a cold side. It's got all these wiggly patterns in between. That's from the electron waves. The electron waves are carrying the heat, and, the, and they are waves. And so they interfere constructively and destructively. So why does this lead to a more efficient thermoelectric? Well, I'm going to try to convince you that the behavior of these electron waves in the propagation of heat is mimicking the actions of a Maxwell demon at the quantum level. OK, so here would be a very simple type of molecule, a single ring connecting a hot and a cold electrode. And if you measure, let's say you bring your probe, your atomically sharp tip labeled by P, if you bring that close to one of these hot atoms of the molecule, it's going to measure a higher temperature than if you have it, let's say, above this cold atom. And why is that so? If you think about this molecule as just a box for electrons, well, ele cold electrons are coming in from there, and hot electrons are coming in from here, and they're all commingling in space and time within this molecule. But because of the wave-like character of the electrons, cold electrons from here, they cannot get into the probe if the probe is here, OK, because the waves interfere destructively. And so essentially, this probe, this is not a demon. It doesn't have any intelligence or any, it even, doesn't even have moving parts. It's just a, a little tip of metal an unthinking piece of metal, but nonetheless, it's able to pick out just the hot electrons from this molecule, and that, because the quantum mechanics of the electrons are essentially mimicking the actions of a Maxwell demon. So basically, when you put a whole bunch of these rings together, the waves, the electron waves are kind of imitating the actions of a Maxwell demon and allowing you to get closer and closer to the best that you could possibly do, this break-even point. OK, but these molecules are all around us, right? They're in what we eat. Um, why haven't we found this demon before? Well, it ends up that the demon, you cannot see it if you don't look closely enough. So here, for instance, on the far left, this is a, something called a graphene nanoribbon, which is a whole bunch of these uh, carbon hexagons all together. And here it, it, it's probed on the far left with an atomically sharp tip. And sure enough, you can see this characteristic electron wave pattern of the hot and cold spots. So this would be a great system for a thermoelectric. But if you blur out the resolution of this thermometer just a little bit, just by two angstroms, right? Two angstroms is very, very, very little. It's only a little bit bigger than an atom, OK? You blur it out by two angstroms, the oscillations are gone. It just looks like a hot side and a cold side, just like you learn in your, let's say, uh, elementary thermodynamics class. So that the demon is there, but you can't see it if you don't look closely enough. So that, 
I would like to conclude here and also acknowledge my co-author on, on the invention, uh, Dr. Justin Bergfield. Thanks for your attention.